We are now on to Article 16, which is entitled Reuse, and that is reuse of animals after they have already been experimented on, that is. Point 1 reads, Member States shall ensure that an animal already used in one or more procedures, that's experiments of course, when a different animal on which no procedure has previously been carried out could also be used, may only be reused in a new procedure provided that the following conditions are met. A. The actual severity of the previous procedure was mild or moderate. B. It is demonstrated that the animal's general state of health and well-being has been fully re restored. Sorry. C. The further procedure is classified as mild, moderate or non-recovery. And D. It is in accordance with veterinary advice, taking into account the lifetime experience of the animal. Part 2 of Article 16 reads... In exceptional circumstances, by way of derogation from point A of paragraph 1, which, if you remember, read the actual severity of the previous procedure was mild or moderate, uh, so basically they're saying that an animal, you can reuse an animal as long as it hasn't been in a severe experiment previously. But this clause says you can use the animal again, if it has been in a severe experiment before, as, and I'll carry on, after a veterinary examination of the animal and the competent authority may allow reuse of any animal. And it just says, provide the animal has not been used more, has not been used more than once in a procedure entailing severe pain, distress or equivalent suffering. So you can reuse an animal that has been in a severe experiment However, if we go back to Article 16 c you will read the further procedure is classified as mild, moderate or non-recovery. So even under Article 16 Part 2, which does allow you to use an animal that has been in a severe experiment, the next experiment, it wouldn't be allowed to be in a severe experiment. It would have to be in a mild, moderate or non-recovery experiment. Uh, remember, go back to Article 15 if you want to look at if you want to hear about the experiments in the classifications of moderate and severe and mild, for that matter, as well. So there's a tiny bit of protection for animals here, but really, I think most people would regard reusing animals after an experiment as inhumane. We're now on to Article 17, End of the Procedure, so that's the end of the experiment. One reads, A procedure shall be deemed to end when no further observations are to be made for that procedure, or, as regards new genetically modified animal lines, when the progeny are no longer observed or expected to experience pain, suffering, distress or lasting harm, equivalent to or higher than that caused by the introduction of a needle. Part 2 reads, At the end of a procedure, a decision to keep an animal alive shall be taken by a veterinarian or by another competent person. An animal shall be killed when it is likely to remain in moderate or severe pain, suffering, distress or lasting harm. So if the animal is in mild pain, then it doesn't have to be killed. Part 3 says where an animal is to be kept alive, which will probably be in mild pain, but it might be kept alive when it's not in any pain at all, of course, it shall receive care and accommodation appropriate to its state of health. Article 19 is about setting free of animals and rehoming. It says Member States may allow animals used or intended to be used in procedures to be rehomed or returned to a suitable habitat or husbandry system appropriate to the species, provided that the following conditions are met. A. The state of health of the animal allows it. B. There is no danger to public health, animal health or the environment. And C. Appropriate measures have been taken to safeguard the well-being of the animal. Article 20. Authorisation of breeders, suppliers and users. 
Member states shall ensure that all breeders, suppliers and users are authorised by and registered with the competent authority. Such authorisation may be granted for a limited period. Authorisation shall be granted only if the breeder, supplier or user and its establishment is in compliance with the requirements of this directive. Article 22. Requirements for Installations and Equipment 1. Member States shall ensure that all establishments of a breeder, supplier or user have installations and equipment suited to the species of animals housed and where procedures are carried out to the performance of the procedures. 2. The design, construction and method of functioning of the installations and equipment referred to in paragraph 1 shall ensure that the procedures are carried out as effectively as possible and aim at obtaining reliable results using the minimum number of animals and causing the minimum degree of pain, suffering, distress or lasting harm. 3. For the purposes of implementation of paragraphs 1 and 2, Member States shall ensure that the relevant requirements as set out in Annex 3 are complied with. OK, we'll have a look at Annex 3. We won't read everything in it, but we'll just have a quick look through it. Here is Annex 3 then. It says requirements for establishments and for the care and accommodation of animals. Section A. And it's talking about the physical facilities, functions and general design. Then it's about holding rooms. Let's have a look at the next slide. And this slide from Annex 3 describes a lot about what it is about, this Annex. It just says temperature, lightning and noise, stocking density, environmental complexity and feeding and handling. Anyway, now I think we'll just take a quick look at Annex 3's requirements as regards stocking densities. Here we're looking at Table 1.3 and this is to do with gerbils. The third column talks about the minimum enclosure size, centimetre squared. The fourth column, floor area per animal, centimetre squared. And the fifth column, minimum enclosure height, and that's in centimetres. This slide is about hamsters, table 1.4, and again you can see the minimum enclosure size, floor area per animal, and the minimum enclosure height. Table 3 is for cats, and this is the minimum space in which a queen and litter may be held is space for a single cat, which shall be gradually increased so that by four months of age, litters have been rehoused following the space requirements for adults. Areas for feeding and for litter trays shall not be less than 0.5 metres apart and shall not be interchanged. Uh, it says minimum for one adult animal. So for, the, for a cat it can have 1.5 metres squares of space and the height can be 2 metres. But that goes down when additional cats are put into the cage then it's only allowed 0.75 meters squared okay this section is on dogs the first sentence reads dogs shall where possible be provided with outside runs so that's not an obligation then dogs shall not be single housed for more than four hours at a time and if we go down to look at table 4 1 it gives a weight so when the dogs weigh up to 20 kilograms, they are allowed 4 meters squared of space and they are allowed 4 meters squared of floor area. And when they are over 20 kilograms, they are allowed 8 square meters, that's a minimum enclosure size, and they are allowed 8 meters squared minimum floor area. Uh, that does say for one or two animals. Table 5 refers to ferrets. Adult males are allowed a minimum enclosure size, and this is not meter squared, this is centimeter squared. 6,000 centimeter squared. 
The height can be 50 centimetres and a minimum floor area per animal is 6,000 centimetres squared. Table 6.1 is about marmosets and tamarinds. Now marmosets, they are allowed a minimum enclosure height of 1.5 metres. And this is an animal that goes up and down trees and everything, so it's not very high, very unnatural for it. Uh, minimum floor area, it's allowed one or two animals plus to the 0.5 metres squared. That doesn't sound very much, does it? Uh, and the tamarinds, they are about the same. Yes, they are. In fact, the tamarinds must be a slightly larger monkey because they are given more floor space. Okay, let's go on to the next table. Table 6.2 is about squirrel monkeys. Uh, the minimum enclosure height, again this is for a monkey, is 1.8 metres. The minimum floor area for one or two animals, and that's metre squared, is 2. So you could theoretically just have one metre squared if you're a squirrel monkey and the height is 1.8. So, I mean, that is just appalling, isn't it? Table 6.3, macaques and vervets. Okay, let's have a look. Minimum enclosure height, which is very important for a monkey. 1.8 for animals less than three years of age. And animals held for breeding purposes, they get two metres. Aren't they the lucky ones? Minimum enclosure size, metres squared, two metres squared. That's for animals less than three years old. Animals from three years of age, they again get two metres squared. So again, they're living their lives in a cage, which is 1.8 metres tall and they have two meters of enclosure size. On to baboons now, table 6.4. Uh, animals held for breeding purposes. The minimum enclosure height is two meters and a baboon is quite a large monkey. Animals from four years of age are allowed 1.8 meters minimum enclosure height. The minimum enclosure size, uh, so that's going to be the floor area, uh, for animals from four years of age and upwards, that would be seven metres. So it's a little bit more than the other monkeys. But again, they don't have much difference in their height, but seven, if I can remember back, is a bit a larger floor size, floor area than the other monkeys were given. Table 7.1 is about cattle. Uh, this must be to do with agricultural research, I suppose. TB vaccines, that kind of thing. They get quite a lot of diseases, don't they, cattle? Uh, well, you can have a look, it's body weight. I mean, I'm not sure how much a, a, a cattle, a cow, I should say, weighs. Uh, the minimum enclosure size seems to be dependent on the weight. Let's have a look at the minimum floor area. So if you are a cow and you weigh over 800 kilograms, you get 10 metres squared to live in. So 10 metres squared, so most people know what that is. A cow is quite a large animal. It's not an awful lot of space when you think about it. Table 7.2 is about sheep and goats. Again, your body weight, if it's over 60 kilograms, the minimum floor area is 1.8 metres squared. So, I'm surprised that they have these type of animals in laboratories anyway. Uh, you would have thought they could have done experiments in the field on this type of animal, the agricultural animals. Anyway, let's have a look at the next slide. Table 7.3, pigs and mini pigs. Okay, looking at the live weight, over 70 to 100 kilograms. 
The minimum enclosure size is three meters squared. I don't know if that is an enclosure for more than one pig. I suppose it must be, and obviously you've got the walls and everything as well. So that adds to the enclosure size. That's not the important measure anyway. The important measure is minimum floor area in column three per animal. And it says if you're a pig, you have a minimum floor area of just one meter squared. And in the fourth column, you have a minimum lying space per animal. And here you have 0.53 meters squared. So these animals have hardly any space whatsoever. Table 7.4 is about equines, which are horses, of course. It says the shortest side shall be a minimum of 1.5 times the wither height of the animal. Now, I'd never heard of that word, but the wither is the ridge between the shoulder blades of the horse. So if you can remember, imagine the shoulder blades of a horse... It is the ridge between them, so you're looking at that height rather than to the top of the head kind of thing. Uh, it goes on, the height of indoor enclosures shall allow animals to rear to their full height. Okay, so minimum floor area. So if you are an animal with, with a height of over 1.6 metres, and you and it is for each animal held singly or in groups of up to three animals, so it could be three animals, you get a space of 16 metres squared to live in. Table 8.1 describes domestic fowl. So if you are a chicken, you have a body mass of over 300 to 600 grams. The minimum enclosure size in metres squared is one meter squared the minimum area per bird in meter squared again is 0 0.05 meters squared which equals 500 centimeters squared so if you were to cut out 500 centimeter squares put them on the floor that would give you a good idea about how much uh, floor area each bird has uh, the minimum height of the cages will be 40 centimetres high. And in the last column it just says minimum length for feed trough. Okay, table 8.7 and it reads zebra finches. And zebra finches are birds. It says enclosures shall be long and narrow. So they're 2 metres long and they're one metre high, it seems, to enable birds to perform short flights. goes on, for breeding studies, pairs may be housed in smaller enclosures containing appropriate enrichment with a minimum floor area of 0 0.5 metres squared and a minimum height of 40 centimetres. I mean, really, that is, that's just nothing, is it? But then, you know, in this country, you can go down to the pet shop, buy a pet, buy a pet bird, and keep it in a tiny little cage for the rest of its life. You know, I'm pretty sure history will look back on that as just legalised cruelty. So anyway, you can read the rest of this table yourself. Okay, this is the last table I'm going to look at, and it's 10.2, and it's about terrestrial snakes. So we'll just have a look. Body length is measured in centimetres, and if you're a snake up to 30 centimetres, you have a minimum floor area of 300 centimetres squared and your minimum enclosure height is 10 centimetres. OK, I think that's enough for Article 22, just to say that there are some other tables of animals. Obviously, there's going to be mice and rats and rabbits. There's also turkeys, quails, there's ducks and geese, pigeons, and there's also some amphibians as well.